All right, good morning. It is June 16, 2023, and we are live with an enlarged crew for Turfgrass Team Times online. Today, we've got Dr. Tyler Carr, Dr. Dave Shetler, Palma Sharat, David Garner, and a newcomer, Dr. Shawi Wu, our entomologist, pathologist. Dr. Wu, would you like to introduce yourself and lead off today? Sure. Um, I'm Xiaowei Wu, the new Turfgrass um, Health Specialist, uh, recently joined at uh, Ohio State University. Actually, I just started that this week, so I do not have much to update, but um, I'm happy to introduce myself to the group. And um, so although I'm new to OSU, but I'm not new to Tefgrass. Um, previously, I did um, five-year PhD on Tefgrass work um, at Virginia Tech. At that time, I studied um, the white grub and build back management. And also then I worked for four years um, on um, grass again at Rutgers University and working on the management of annual progress waiver, um, which is also a past uh, currently occurring in Ohio State uh, every, pretty much every way. I'm very excited to join OSU. And then, um, so some of my information can be found in the uh, website. Let me see. So um, if you look at the um, bug eye turf, the OSU, the EDU um, slash people. And um, so at the bottom of the page, sorry, at the bottom of the page, you can see um, my information. And if you click on the picture and you can um, see more details about me. And, and also another thing is that um, because I just got my phone number yesterday, so it's not added to website yet. Um, you're welcome to call me or email me uh, if you have health, um, tough gross health issues um, like past disease and problems. Thank you. All right, Dr. Wu. Up next, uh, I think we have Dr. Gardner, Dr. Dave Gardner. Right. Good morning, everybody. And yes, Dr. Wu, welcome to OSU. By the way, if you were wondering who sent you the strange email inviting you to speak at the OTF conference and show this coming December, that was me. We can talk more about that after this recording, if you would like. Um, in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about weed issues. And you remember during the month of May, I talked about why are we having no mo May? Because, you know, like all of these plants that are supposed to provide um, flower for or flowers for pollinators, they're not actually, you know, like fully in bloom yet. Well, now they are. So things like white clover and bird's foot trefoil, these are blooming all over the place, right? It's not so uncommon to drive around and see stuff like this. And, you know, with this bird's foot trefoil, this is a relatively newer um weed, if you want to put it that way, uh, here in Ohio. I have a feeling, though, that people are planting this on purpose in some instances, because, like, if you look at this population here, there's no way that this came in naturally, or, I don't know, maybe it didn't. It took a long time for it to, but this particular species is used very commonly as a forage crop, um, and the ag industry loves it because they knew that it's a very high-value um, forage for animals, and so they're planting it all over the place. So, you know, whether it's being planted on purpose or it's coming in from agricultural lands, the bottom line is, is that when you see bright yellow flowers right now, it could be oxalis, it could be black medic, but honestly, neither of those have the impact visually from a distance that um, bird's foot trefoil does. So if you see something like this, there's a decent chance that that's um, the plant that you're dealing with. Now, if you're trying to get rid of it, okay, herbicides for clover and related species, that would be MCPP, clopyrrolid if you work on a golf course, or fluoroxapyr if you're working anywhere else. Among these, we know that fluoroxapyr tends to have a little bit better activity on white clover and bird's foot trefoil compared to MCPP, but either of them should be effective. Um, you will get better long-term control if you use the ester form of the herbicide this fall. Both of these are perennial species, and so the ester form will give you better long-term control um, compared to treatment now. But go ahead and treat now, but use the amine formulation. Speaking of other plants that are in bloom, you might also see this ground ivy, otherwise known as creeping charlie, and so you can recognize it by the flower. It's in the mint family, so it also has square-shaped stems, but then it has these runners and everywhere that you see a pair of leaves, you also see it rooting into the ground. So a relatively easy plant to identify. 
It's easy to identify, it's not so easy to get rid of. Now, as far as herbicide options, that varies by the population and the location. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of variability in how our products work and whether or not they're effective or not. As a general rule, I would say plan on using some of your more expensive three or four way herbicides that contain preferably triclopyr or dicambo or quinclorac or fluoroxapyr or a combination of those. Okay, that's one idea. Now, another strategy is to use the herbicide Sure Power. It contains um, the active ingredient flumioxazin. Flumioxazin is particularly active on Creeping Charlie. And so within three to five days of applying this product, you will get rid of the Creeping Charlie. The trick is, is that flumioxazin can be quite phytotoxic on turf grass if you have newly emerging leaf tissue. So normally we recommend using this product during the months of June, July, or August, and only on turf grass that's green, but not actively growing, okay? And so Sure Power is a great product for weed control, but again, you can have that phytotoxicity issue. You need to be careful with the condition of the turf at the time of application. As far as grassy weed control goes, um, your crabgrass should be looking sort of like this, depending on where you are in the state. If you're in Northern Ohio, it might not yet be uh, trying to tiller or it might still be like, you know, one to three leaf. Um, in Southern Ohio, it might be a little bit further along, maybe looking like this. But my point is, is that all of the crabgrass in most places is still kind of small. So if you see big fat leaves poking out of the ground that look like this, that are a half an inch in diameter, they are not crabgrass, okay? That is going to be field pass palum, which is unique because it's a tropical species, but it doesn't come from seed, it's a perennial, okay? And so um, if you have field pass palum, now through August is a great time to attempt to control that. Two applications of the herbicide to pramazone, three weeks apart um, is what I recommend for that. For crabgrass, look, it's better to wait until July to control that. If you control it now, you're just leaving voids in the turf and more crabgrass is gonna germinate, okay? So let that uh, crabgrass get up and become, you know, basically pretty visible. Um, about the time that it stops actively tillering, that's when our herbicides start to work really, really well. If you use a half a rate of quinclorac combined with either a half a rate of tapramazone or a half a rate of mesotrione, that's kind of in my mind, the best combination, the best strategy for herbicide control of crabgrass. But again, timing is everything. You can control it now, but you're going to have more crabgrass come back in. It's better just to wait. And that is my update for this week. Oh, thank you, Dr. Gardner. Some useful advice as always. Pamela Chirac, what do you got? Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, um, I wanted to preface this by saying that my section today will be for, for sports turf managers, so not really for the homeowner. Um, I have been fielding quite a few questions this week from sports turf managers about Bermuda grass. And the reason that that became about was because my article for Sports Field Management magazine dropped where I talked about the pros and cons of rye grass. And I did not mention using it as an overseeding tool for Bermuda grass in the winter because um, my my column is aimed towards cool season turf managers, not the warm season. But anyway, so I, I did end up fielding quite a few questions and having some great dialogue. And I think this conversation about the use of Bermuda grass on sports fields and professional sports in Ohio is, is one worth having. And I think we're still having it. We're still looking at how we use Bermuda grass in Ohio. Um, I know of several high schools, colleges, and professional uh, facilities that have Bermuda grass currently, predominantly in the south along the Ohio River. Um, we have some obviously at the Cincinnati Bengals practice facility. Uh, the University of Rio Grande there in the southeast of Ohio have their, their soccer complex is Bermuda grass, latitude 36, I believe. Um, and then our OTF, ex-OTF president, Ryan DeMeo, of course, has been, in, has been working with Bermuda in central Ohio the guys at Purdue have had uh, have had Bermuda for many years. Uh, we've we've done a lot of research with it over the years at the turf grass farm. Um, you know, it's a warm season grass. It does best from May through October, from the end of October until May. It's brown. It's dormant. Uh, those are the times when it would be overseeded with something like perennial ryegrass, annual ryegrass, transitional ryegrass. Um, to if you are if you need to extend it. So I was talking to Scott Morrissey. He's, the, he's one of the soccer coaches at Rio Grande this week. Um, he does not overseed because that transition period, that transition from rye 
getting the rye in and then trying to take the rye out in the spring is difficult. It's not as smooth, I think, as people think that you can't just sort of go in with a chemical and spray and then that's it. And then overnight it becomes Bermuda in the spring. So that transition period can be a challenge. And so he has not typically overseeded, but if they get to state champions this year, he will be. And so we'll be having these conversations again. So I guess the point of this, of me talking today is, uh, we know that it's continuing to be an option for sports turf managers and other professional turf managers in Ohio. Uh, there's some exciting cultivars out there. It does fantastic in the Ohio summers. It's very hard wearing. It produces an elite playing surface for sports. The challenges are obviously the winter dormancy, the level of management that it needs, the mowing height can be a challenge for some if they don't have the right equipment. So we're still, you know, looking at it at Ohio State. We have several professionals coming in to OTF this December to talk about it and to talk about how they manage it. Um, and I guess um, I'll finish by saying, if you have a question about Bermuda, should I try it? What should I do? I have Bermuda. How do I manage it? Um, and also, I will say, actually, if you're a homeowner, because I inherited a Bermuda grass lawn. If you are a homeowner and you think that you inherited either a zoysia grass or you have a zoysia grass or Bermuda grass lawn and you have some questions, reach out to us. Um, we can point you in the direction of fact sheets or, or research that's been done. Uh, we can talk to you. I'm going to go out down to Rio Grande in August and meet with Scott again, look at his facility. Um, so that's it. We can we can help you. We can, you know, shout out to us if you need help or questions. If you have suggestions for us um, in, you know, this kind of research would really help, uh, then we are here to listen to that too. So that's my. That's my I've seen, I've I've seen Pamela. Yes, very important. Uh, however, the, the bigger thing is commiserations if you do have Bermuda grass in your lawn. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, I have it. Now, you raise a great question because you raise a great point because I have it. But I it mixes with uh, I have it mixed with bluegrass and tall fescue. I have a whole mix in my lawn, and I can tell you that I never water my lawn ever. I have a south facing lawn with it that I never water, and I don't have to worry. The only weed that doesn't seem to be able to outcompete it in a lawn south facing is ground ivy. So they the, went out. The ground ivy outcompetes the Bermuda, or the Bermuda mm -hmm. outcompetes the. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I have a slope. I have a, a south-facing slope, and the ground ivy just that's that's the niche I think for ground ivy is that south-facing high high point. Um, so you know, from a homeowner's perspective, Bermuda grass can be a real pain because it will get into your flower beds and it's very stolonifers, very rhizomatous, extremely difficult. It's not one of those satisfying weeds to pull out of a flower bed. <laughs> there are many. <laughs> weeds that's not one of them so you're saying it's got kind of steroid type capabilities i think is all right grass on steroids also known as bermuda grass all right uh thank you pamela dr carr yeah i think if they were to try to grow any grass on mars it would probably be a bermuda grass it could, it'd probably be the first to come back after some type of uh nuclear bomb I mean, I've, I've even seen a picture of a traffic cone set on a on on a piece of grass, and the Bermuda grass grows up through the hole in the traffic cone. I mean, it's it's crazy. But if you plant a tree, it won't grow anywhere. So yeah, it's and, and uh, drop the temperature to fifteen degrees, and it'll die forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. But Bermuda grass would be doing well in this environment that we've had with the with the drought stress conditions that we've seen on our cool season grasses. So this is the uh, U.S. drought monitor. Um, this is from uh, three days ago, uh, June 13th. So we're, we're on this uh, June 16th right now. So most of our state is under moderate drought conditions, but this does not account for um, the rainfall we've had recently. If I can get to shift over here we go so over the last three days we've received over two inches of rain in a lot of areas of the state um some places upwards of three inches now up in the northeastern part of the i mean the northwestern part of the state and the southwestern part of the state um, we've received less rainfall 
but in in most of the state we've had enough rainfall right now where where you could probably turn that irrigation system off for the next couple days at least and we may have some rain coming through early next week now i and i say this because i on my drive into work this morning i noticed a couple areas that were being irrigated even though we've in columbus received um around two and a half or three inches of rain over the last couple of days. And so, you know, while the grass is in many cases still um, showing dormant uh, conditions right now, we, uh, I mean, the, the grass can't take up excess water if the soil is already saturated. So it, it's going to take a couple weeks, at least, if you have adequate rainfall and good temperatures like we've had recently, which I don't really foresee us having, you know, these temperatures in the low 80s or 70s, um, going it much further into the summer. But it's going to take, under optimal conditions, it would take at least two or three weeks um, for these grasses to begin recovering. So if we get through, get into a period where um, there are more drought stress conditions or, or lower rainfall, um, then turn that irrigation back on so that the grass can continue to recover. It's, um, you know, it's active. There just may not be green grass yet. Um, if you have areas that are recovering um, from drought stress and you can, and the weather is cool enough uh, for, for a little bit of a stretch um, and you can keep water on it, I have no problem with applying a small amount of nitrogen fertilizer. I'm talking about a tenth of a pound, just something to stimulate some growth, nothing excessive. So we're talking about a tenth of a pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet, um, just enough to, to stimulate a little growth. Nothing, if, if you over fertilize these areas excessively, um, it can come back and bite you and you can have negative consequences. So, so Dr. Kahn. I'm going to give you a, a quick question on your math because homeowners don't necessarily understand what a tenth of a pound per mm -hmm. is. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give uh, Dr. Shetler a chance to finish up. But while I'm doing that, if somebody has a fertilizer bag that states it's 20, 20, 20, and uh, they are going to apply a tenth of a pound per thousand square feet, can you come back to me and give me an amount of product that they would need to apply? And then... Folks that are watching, if your lawn is a thousand square feet, then you're going to apply that much. If your lawn is five thousand square feet, then you're going to multiply the number that Dr. Carr gives you by five to get an estimate of how much you should be putting out. Because we've had an example recently where we think someone put out thirty-five pounds of N per thousand square feet. It, it was the it was the equivalent oh, no, nine, of about ten, ten pounds of, right. of N per one thousand square feet. So yeah, I'll come back with a number. So I think the word would be smoking if you do that. Yes, uh, on fire. All right. Dr. Shatler. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, when I used to teach uh, the, the two-year turf students and I would start giving them those kinds of questions, I'd see panic in their eyes. And, and so it's fun watching Tyler. He's, no problem. I'll do that calculation for you. So uh, it, it's always amazing to me that, that, you know, when it comes to what I consider to be fairly simple math, people can panic on that. Uh, when it comes to the bugs, uh, this has really been an interesting year compared to our last five years. So we've had these periods of lower than normal temperatures uh, and much lower than normal uh, rainfall events. Now, if you remember back with Tyler's uh, image, the, the one thing that was kind of uh, interesting to me is that if you'll notice, there was a lack of drought. Uh, and fairly low drought conditions up in that Lima area, that, that central western Ohio zone. Uh, and our entomologist, that we have a extension specialist who's an entomologist in that area. And last year he reported that they were seeing more Japanese beetles than they had ever seen before. Uh, and those kinds of weather conditions, the, you know, slightly... Yeah, you know, either normal uh, soil moisture or only slightly below is really going to be favorable to those Japanese beetles. And so I'm going to be really interested to see the reports. Uh, will the Japanese beetles come up uh, in those areas? Now, 
but let's face it, that part of Ohio is not known for having a whole bunch of turf grass issues. It's, you know, corn, soybean, corn, soybean, and, and so forth. But uh, there are people that have lawns and, and there are some golf courses in those areas and so forth. So it'd be interesting to see if we do get a hot spot of Japanese beetle this year. Speaking of hot spots, uh, here in central Ohio, our linden trees uh, or basswood trees are in full bloom. Uh, and what I've been noticing, I've, my neighbor has one, uh, and, and it's very fragrant if you walk over into to her front yard uh, from that, that linden tree. But the thing that I've noticed is that there were virtually no army worms. Uh, and so when we have the common army worm, our native species that overwinters here, when we have outbreak populations, those linden trees, will you'll actually kind of hear a rustling going on from all of the army worms uh, getting nectar from those trees. And I saw none of them uh, when I inspected her tree. There were some bees working them, and, and I, as we would expect. Uh, so my feeling is we're not going to see a common army worm outbreak. And my colleagues down in the southern states are not talking about the fall army worm. So I don't think we're going to have another uh, fall worm uh, invasion like we saw a couple of years ago. So we're probably pretty good to be free from uh, the grubs are, are late. Uh, I keep running my light trap a couple of times a week. And uh, when I ran it this week in between the rainfall events, all I got was two. Now, these are going to be June beetles because I got them in June. Uh, however, I, I did take a look at them and they were the same species that came out in May for the May beetles. So, you know, that's why I say they're, they're May June beetles uh, because uh, they do uh, fly during that uh, uh, window. Uh, but I haven't gotten any mass chafers yet. Uh, and, and uh, you know, last year we had a very low population of mass chafers. They were fairly late. It appears that they're going to be late again this year. What does this all mean in terms of grub control? Well, if you're going to put down uh, some of the neonicotinoids that we know that are, are really cheap and inexpensive to use, like imidacloprid or Merit, uh, Bayer especially is emphasizing that if you're going to use their Merit product, apply it in July. Uh, in other words, apply the product at the time that the eggs are in the soil and hydrating and ready to hatch, you'll have them. Oh no, Dr. Shetler, your internet has failed us. Uh, okay, I'm sure he's gonna be frozen there for a minute. Dr. Shetler uh, was probably going to finish off with, um, the idea that we were uh, going to wrap up on needing to apply when you get the most value out of those products. I'm sure Dr. Shetler will be back. Um, all right, so Dr. Carr, going back to you, and then Dr. Uh, Pamela, we need to go back to you one second as well, but Dr. Carr first, after I put you on the spot. Yeah, if, you, if you're if you using a 20-20-20 fertilizer, um, that would be only a half a pound of fertilizer mm -hmm. per 1,000 square feet. So um, what you could do is take that and just use a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. And that would be one pound of fertilizer per 1000 square feet. And with those products, you, you would need to water them in following that application um, just so you don't get any, uh, any uh, burn from that product. And so, so people who are watching should be able to extrapolate out somewhat based on those numbers. So if, if you had a 10,000 square foot lawn and you end up putting out a half pound of product, you are light, right? Mm -hmm. that, that 2020 product, uh, you should be putting out uh, approximately five pounds of product in that instance. Um, most and of those if spread... You, well, if you put out the whole bag, then your grass is probably going to be browner than it was when it started. That's... Yes, it is. Now I can see Dr. Gardner is something very profuse or profound that he wants to say. No, is that not the case there? No. Okay, he's just shaking his head in fear. Uh Pamela, you have something you, you wanted to bring up. Did Dr. Shetler want to finish up? I'll go back to him. He's oh, in the I, back. I, I, yeah, I was I was just uh finishing up the that uh it looks like the we we are still posed that we could have some white grip populations. Uh, the annual bluegrass weevil uh, uh, 
Xiao Wu is going to, to probably take over that, uh, but uh, they are they are in they are finishing their first generation, uh, and, and uh, we'll probably talk next week uh, about uh, what to do about any new adults of the second generation. Uh, what we want to do is avoid using a whole bunch of pyrethroid insecticides. Right now, we haven't seen resistance to the pyrethroids with our annual bluegrass weevils. Uh, but we could develop it if we don't use our insecticides correctly. Uh, and, and so, uh, again, I, I recommend try, try to avoid using your pyrethroids any more than two times three max uh, during the season uh, in order to, to uh, avoid that uh, development of resistance problem. Thank you, Dr. Shatter. Thank you to your internet. Pamela. I am going to give a plug again to the Ohio Sports Field Managers Association uh, Summer Field Day, which is June 27th here on campus, on main campus, at the 4-H facility across from uh, the Schottenstein Center. Um, it is an OSFMA slash OSU summer work day, summer field day. Um, we have education in the morning, Dr. Carr and Dr. Gardner are talking in the morning, and then we're going over and we get a great tour of OSU Varsity Athletics facilities, which is gonna be great. Um, to register, you go to ohioturfgrass.org, or you can you can um, see on social media, Ohio Turf Grass or OSFMA. Um, I know that I tweeted it out. It's, we've already got, I think, close to 60 people registered. Um, it's going to be a fantastic event. So um, a lot of us will be there. If you haven't met some of us and you would like to and not to come network and meet some of your peers, get some education, have a great tour of the OSU facilities. Um, June 27th, OhioTurfGrass.org. Thank you, Pamela. All right. Just a couple of things to wrap up with the moisture uh, in those heavily shaded lawns. You're probably going to see some powdery mildew firing up pretty quickly. Uh, that was something I noticed this week. Uh, and a couple of areas that were heavily shaded. Uh, temperatures are not getting out of control from the standpoint of diseases just yet. So some of the big bangers, uh, things like Pythium brown patch, probably not firing too badly. Now, maybe further south, uh, that might be a potential issue. Uh, the last thing to mention is our field day event. Uh, we are lining up next week as far as trying to get that schedule put together. So uh, topics, content, they will be released in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Uh, for people to peruse. Um, and we are also making progress on uh, the OTF convention and show, and we conference from show, and we have uh, confirmations from speakers such as uh, Ben McGraw, Stacey Bonos, Joe Vargas, uh, all coming into town amongst many others. And so uh, look for information on that as well. With that, uh, we will wrap it up. And uh, Dr. Carr is leaving information. Uh, Dr. Carr, is our website now live? Or is that something you want to talk about next week? Yeah, let's go ahead and say it. The website is live. Um, and it's it's a modification of the former Buckeye Turf site. Um, and we've had a lot of help from, from Bree Schneider, who works in, in our department on developing this. Um, and so this is a, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a one-stop shop for all things, um, extension output, research, and, and our academic programs. So you can find each of us on that site. Um, and yeah, hope you enjoy it. We've, uh, we're really excited about it. Thank you, Dr. Carr. We know you've done a lot of work on that. Uh, emails, if you have questions, bookiturf at osu.edu. Uh, then our tw Twitter handles and also the podcast, uh, Turf Team Times are all available for uh, your uh, consummate uh, needs as far as turf grass. Uh, I'm sure some people would find this nauseating, but there are plenty of us who are interested in that. Uh, once again, thank you for your time, folks. We will talk to you all next week.